in your mind today, what are the, the, the sports or the disciplines that could benefit the most from using Moxie in, in their testing protocols and, and maybe even in their training because it is such a, an easy tool to use now that you can actually use it to, to auto-regulate or to, 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 to plan some, some sessions in real time. So where do you see the, the most benefit in terms of, of sport or discipline? Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I think that there's more benefit. So most of this classical diagnostics, physiology diagnostics is very endurance based. Mm-hmm. So like these lactate threshold stuff, it's all come from the endurance side. Um, so I think the, the big advantages will come in, in intermittent sports like hockey or soccer or something where, uh, um, so if, if anyone ever does, if you repeated shuttle runs or you do a continuous incremental running test, you realize those are not the same thing. Start and stop and change of direction mess everything up. Mm-hmm. So uh, continuous running tests to assess fitness of a, of a soccer player or a football player is uh, suboptimal, I would mm-hmm. say. So, and then a lot of people see this. That's why you see more and more often these in the shuttle tests. Um, there's uh, the, the 3015 test from Boucher is, is used a lot. Um, I think these are great tests to do. The problem with these tests is then you do no physiological measures, maybe heart rate. Mm. And then you just do, you take like Boucher's table and you say, well, what level did you get to? And you correlate that to the VO2 value, which he bought out of, a running test anyways. Right. So, right. But a moxie would exactly, you could use a moxie there. You could, you could measure, um, you know, minimal oxygen values and recovery rates and things like that. Um, which is cool. Right. You could then, uh, you could then do some, some assessments there, which you can't do anything else. So I think those sports would benefit a lot from doing sporter sport specific testing, but mm-hmm. still getting a logical measure out of it. That doesn't need to be in the lab. So I think that's where the, the benefits, the biggest, because there's nothing else. That's why, um, I would say, yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. So on a on a you know thirty fifteen for example, with the Moxie data, what would you look for in the trends, and then how would you use that? To, uh, would you would you be able to use any of that to then program, or would it more be to really test, retest, and see the the changes in terms of oh you know maybe. We, start, we started seeing this trend on level four or level 10. And then the, the, the next test he did, we only saw that on level 14 or 15. So we must assume that between the two, that there's actually been a progress at, at that level beyond just the score of the test. Would... Mm-hmm. So um, a couple of things are generally, um, uh, if you, I would never gauge like better or worse based on what happens with your Moxie data. So better or worse is you have a performance measure. If you're faster, you're better. I don't care what your Moxie data says. Right? It's very clear. There's a goal. We've defined what's better. If faster is better. Um, and so I do think the Moxie data is actually the more important for planning your training to try to make sure that the next time you are better. Mm-hmm. Um, and what's important then is that the pre and the post test would be to be like, okay, I think this is the reason why we're training we need to do based on the results. You do a training and then you see, are we better or not? Yes or no. And you see, did the nearest data change the way that I thought it would and it's better or no, it didn't change. I thought it would and it's worse. So you, you start kind of piecing these things together, mm-hmm. um, which takes, uh, um, you know, it, the experience obviously. Um, but there's a couple things that you would look at. So, First of all, these how low people can desaturate, I think is an important and very simple measure to look at. Generally, the lower you desaturate, the, the be, let's say better you are in most cases. And so now I wouldn't necessarily always compare this between people, but um, I would compare this pre and post, like you can desaturate further down. So your muscles probably somehow with the quality there improved mm. and hopefully performance is better. Um, the recovery rates are very interesting. So like how quick, if you're doing a 30, 15, like how, how are you jumping back up? Um, because there, uh, there is, uh, relevance there for, uh, repeated 
repeated performance measures. Mm -hmm. And how, how would you then influence that recovery curve in terms of trying to reload O2 as, as fast as you can? Because that's, that's kind of the name of the game. If you take soccer, uh, rugby, that a sport that I work with, uh, you know, how fast can you go from a high-intensity effort to recovering to then being ready for the next one? Uh, yeah, so basically if, if, if you – if you decide based on your nearest value that the problem is that your athlete has crappy recovery. So usually crappy recovery is very much related to uh, good oxygen utilization. Right. So people will have very low values and have very crappy recovery. And it looked like crappy recovery. So basically they're just, they're really good at using the oxygen, including in this oxygen debt, right? So you have an oxygen debt. Mm -hmm. And so if someone's good at using oxygen, they will continue using oxygen to resupply in the break, which keeps the O2 low, mm -hmm. right? So it's all, if you have all these low two values and slow recovery values, it all has to do with, you're really good at using oxygen, which means you're probably in relation, not good at bringing oxygen in. Okay. And so now you have to start deciding, well, if my goal of my training plan is to somehow supply more oxygen, how are you going to do that? You need a training that is either somehow going to, if we get back to these limiter discussions would be, um, I need to, my heart needs to be, I need to, be able to pump more blood. That'll be like an obvious one. I need to make sure I can breathe enough oxygen. That'll be the cardiac and the respiratory ones. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's that whole system in between, which is a little bit harder to gauge, right? You have the, the whole delivery system in between and it's always like a cutoff what area is now supply and what area is demand, right? You, you could argue that at a muscular perspective as well. Um, and so classically what we would have done with like hockey players often is things like respiratory training. And uh, so I work for a company that makes a respiratory training device. You can buy that. <laughs> <laughs> um, but no, because generally speaking, you can do, you know, it's people, I've had people that do yoga. There's numerous things you can do re respiratory training the respiratory system can limit performance. And there's, there's Dempsey as, as a bunch of research on that. And if you're from Switzerland, Boutelier is a bunch of research on that. So you can train your, your respiratory system specifically. And uh, so that's one thing that we did. Another thing is doing training that would increase cardiac output. Mm -hmm. um, now, what training does that? That's up to you, you're the trainer. That's not my problem. I told you what the problem is, so you go and do it, right? <laughs> Um, no, but that, that, that is, that is an issue. How do you, you, all of a sudden you're confronted with this information that says not, this is your heart rate zone to do, go do your endurance training. It's like, no, you specifically need to increase cardiac output. And then every trainer is like, and how do I do that? I don't know. <laughs> Figure it out. Yeah. That, that's the question. How do you do that? Um, classically I tell people, we'll go do endurance training at lower heart rate zones. Mm -hmm. That's like the classic go ahead and do that. There's some good data that shows you actually have higher cardiac output values at higher intensities. Right. Um, there's data that shows you want to maximize cardiac output, uh, reduce blood flow back to your heart. So tie off your legs for a little okay. while and then open it up again. And then all the blood flow comes back and your heart goes huge preload and you get this huge cardiac output. Mm -hmm. This is all kind of experimental. Like, I don't know what you're going to do with it with your athletes, but this is, <laughs> a very good question and it is a problem in that you're asking new the diagnostics is is offering new ideas as to why performance can be limited mm. but the training the empirical data for training isn't there right so you're confronted with with these issues um and i don't always have a good answer as to what to do um i i think it depends if your athlete's improving keep doing whatever you're doing and if your athlete's not improving, is super frustrated, you tend to have more leeway to be experimental. Mm -hmm. Then yeah. you can try out shit and you could, you know, hey, we're going to tie your legs today and you're going to go ride the bike. We're going <laughs> to open it up. And we're